much for that. A little bit different worship service, but it was a, a pray to the heart, from the heart for us as well. Um, if you will, let's prepare our hearts again, if we haven't already, for the reading of God's Word. And in a moment, we're going to read God's Word, and then we're going to expound God's Word and take that application for us to life. But before we do any of that, let's approach the Lord in a word of prayer, seeking His will and, and opening our hearts. Yes, ma'am. Floyd and Lola, about the state that they were before um, the last kind of update that you had heard. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, let's continue to pray for that family as well. Uh, let's again take our hearts uh, and minds to the Lord, first in a word of prayer, and preparing our hearts to hear his word, already ready to obey God's word. Let us also be ready to search our hearts as the Lord shines a light on our heart our intention on our, our thoughts and on our actions today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you today, and uh, we thank you for this day that you've given, that you bless us with. Thank you so much for this church, this fellowship. Thank you for the love that you have shared here, the grace and mercy that you have shared here, but thank you for this free opportunity to gather in your name. You are Lord. Uh, you have supremacy. You are in leadership here. And we pray now, though, that we would open our hearts, that we would soften our hearts to you as you present to us your word, exactly what you have to say to us, that word that pierces um, to the very depths of who we are, that will show us everything about us, show us our thoughts, our actions, our words, and our, even our motives. But we come to you broken and humble before you as you even convict through your Holy Spirit and make that known to us through your Holy Spirit as you teach us your word through your Holy Spirit and as you guide us and convict us. We just pray, though, that your will would be done right now, that if there's any area here that you want to teach us in which we need to grow, which there is always many, much room for all of us to grow, we pray that that would be done and that the lost souls, though even today, would be saved before it's too late. We love you and we thank you, and it's in Christ's precious name we do pray. Amen. If you will, let's turn to the book of Jude. Uh, there's one chapter, but we'll go ahead and say chapter 1. Uh, go to chapter, or verse 12 of chapter 1. And what we've been doing, we're going to go 12 through 16. We're going to read those verses first and then dig a little bit deeper and bring, expound those verses today. But what we've been doing here in the book of Jude, Jude has been dedicated completely to teaching about false teachers, teaching about apostates. Those may be some who at one point had claimed to be Christian, had claimed some connection with Jesus Christ or with his church, but who have finally and ultimately rejected Christ rejected the true gospel, rejected the authority of the word of God. When we were going through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, we even saw some of that taught even there, that the false teachers there, that there were some that were first with the original disciples, but then they went out from them. And John said, inspired of the Holy Spirit, that they went out from them because they were never of them. My friend, someone who is an apostate, rejecting Christ, rejecting the true authority of the gospel and the word of God, they are only showing that they were never truly saved, that they never had the truth to begin with. There are some, we know, believers that falter, that, that are become prodigal, and, and at some point even and God works on them and comes back, right? But if someone totally and completely rejects Christ never to return, it only shows that they never knew him to begin with. If someone lives in unrepentant sin and with no, no harm or no conviction to them, and live in ease, it's, it's a sad sign that they likely do not have the Holy Spirit of God. But let's jump into this text today. 
Again, he's talking dedicated specifically about teaching about what the apostates look like, how they practice in their life for us to be on guard and us to make sure that we are not deceived and we are not led astray, that we don't buy into that ideology and and follow suit and are misdirected and fall away from God, turn away from God. But let's look here in, in, in verse 12. But before we look at verse 12, know that that's one thing that was stated at the very beginning, that these apostates really have crept in unawares. Even amongst churches today, Christian fellowships today, that there are those that are proclaiming, yeah, I'm a Christian, but their life looks completely like what is stated in the book of Jude. And it said in the very beginning of Jude, right, that they have rejected the Lord and they have turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. Really, they, they've turned the grace of God, and get this, this is a big point that you're going to, we saw all the way through Jude. They have turned the grace of God into a license to sin. My friend, we must be aware of that. If there are people that proclaim to be Christian that we admire, admire today, if they're a living life like sin doesn't matter and like God doesn't exist, and like they will not have to answer to Almighty God, that is not an example to follow. If we have been buying that false idea for ourselves and have been living in unrepentant sin and living like grace is something to trample on and grace has given you freedom to live in sin, today is the day to turn and repent of that and turn back and hold to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's look today. Again, uh, let us search our hearts today. Let's make sure we're not following examples that are are clearly spoken of here. Don't uh, be this way today. Verse 12, it says this. It says, speaking of apostates, it says, These are spots in your feast of charity. And this is going to be packed. It's going to say, description after description after description it's going to give in this this first two verses it's going to give metaphors describing apostates but we're going to go back in a minute and explain those but again it's packed full um, description after description so be aware today but take notice ask yourself does that describe me ask yourself that examine yourself today And if that describes you, have all that is within you ready to repent of that and turn back to God. It says here, it says, these are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's men's persons in admiration because of advantage. So let's go back to the first two verses, 12 and 13, and let's really unpack what all of these metaphors describing the apostates are. It starts out with, it says, these are spots in your feast of charity, and I'm just going to tell you, yes, they are spots or stains, and it says uh, in the feast of your charity. And what feasts of their charity are was 
In essence, their love fellowships, their love meals. At the early church, they would gather together and they would have a feast together. Like we have potlucks, right? Not now because of COVID, sadly, but hopefully to return to that soon. But they would have potlucks where everyone would bring something and would love each other and would share what they have together. And then they would simply enjoy loving fellowship with one another. That was what the early church did. Um, However, even in the book of Corinthians, it was described that some would use those occasions and would be there only to jump in front of everyone else. For instance, those that were rich and brought the fancy dishes, the expensive, the good food. They would push the poor to the side and wouldn't want to share with them and would jump right up to the front feed themselves, and it's called a love charity or a charity feast, and would clearly have no love to it. Amen? Not considering others more important than themselves. That was what the church at Corinth had made the uh, love feast, and this being described in the book of Jude, it was very similar. These people professing to be Christians, um, whether in the case of the church at Corinth, likely some of them were unsaved, likely some of them were simply carnal believers, which that was the church at Corinth. It was marked by at the beginning having very, very carnal or selfish um, even believers. But again, God is growing us out of that unto love. He's increasing us in love. But it says here, it says, these are spots or stains in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. What's that saying? Well, again, it was all about them. They didn't care about the ones that they were fellowshipping with. They didn't want to make sure they were taken care of or that they were fed. It was all about them. It was all about them. And I'll tell you, it is a spot. It is a stain. Any Christian fellowship. If us as believers, we must examine ourselves today, if us as believers, if, if the church or the community recognizes us as, as nothing but selfish and self-interest and don't even care about our brothers and sisters around us, it's a spot, it's a stain. It doesn't look well. But the word used here for spots actually has a deeper, more descriptive meaning. It actually means a dangerous, dangerous hidden reef. In essence, with a ship at sea, there's a hidden reef below that the ship cannot see, and it is dangerous and destructive that if they hit that at any moment, the ship's going down. For us as believers, if, if there are apostates who don't know God and are 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 professing to be a part of the fellowship, professing to be Christian, but clearly have not the love of God and the love for each other, it is a shipwreck waiting to happen. For us as believers, let us ask ourselves today, are we of a loving people and a selfless people? It also says next in these descriptions, clouds they are without water. What does that mean? Well, have you ever, uh, one, maybe even been in the desert and all you want is rain to be cooled off, to be refreshed, maybe even you're, you're thirsty? Have you ever, if we're not, um, not all the time, are, are all of the people, uh, farmers depending upon the rain? But my friend, for the farmers uh, to be able to produce and harvest what they are intending on and hoping to harvest, there is a hope in having rain. And once the clouds are on the horizon horizon, and they're promising rain, but yet they bring no rain, it is the cloud proclaiming to be something that it's not, making empty promises. My friend, I share with you today that today much of Christianity Much of the false teachers and false churches of today are proclaiming to be offering to the people God. 
offering to the people spiritual food and, and water. But my friend, do you know how many churches and how many false teachers only share fluff and only share what is popular and exciting to the world and never get around to sharing the actual word of God? It is like a cloud promising water, but yet brings no water. My friend, we need the water. We need the living water of God. We need this spiritual refreshing food right here in front of us, the word of God. I promise you we're going to be walking around spiritually bankrupt if we are not feasting each week but also each day on the word of God. But yet there are many churches today that are are popular, have a mass following, have a lot of people excited to come, come excited, leave happy, leave with their feelings all intact, but yet they received nothing. No spiritual food, no water, no word of God. It's also like this, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 2, it says, My doctrine, right? My doctrine shall drop as the rain. The word of God. His doctrine, his His important teachings in the word of God, they shall drop as the rain, refreshing and filling and satisfying and essential to growth. It says, my speech, God says, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Amen? We only find that right here in the word of God. It also says carried about, description here in Jude, it says carried about of winds. What does that mean? Well, we see elsewhere in scriptures that some people are are not grounded in the word of God. As believers today, we must be grounded in the word of God. But it says that they're carried about as winds. That really means they're tossed to and fro by every false doctrine that comes about. You know how many preachers are that way as well? Proclaiming that, yeah, I'm a Christian, yeah, I'll teach the Word of God. But do you know sometimes that they'll hear the next popular or next exciting um, teaching out there and they will run to that, right? But my friend, as us as believers... We must get the word of God, the truth. We must be grounded in the truth, firm. We must know what we believe and why we believe it because we see it in the word of God for ourselves. We must be grounded so well and planted like a tree beside the still waters that when the storm comes or when even this this. The wind blows in with a new false doctrine or new false philosophy philosophy that is prevalent in the world today that you will stay and remain firm. Amen? You've got the truth. So many people, even not just necessarily in a Christian fellowship today, but so many people even take their teaching or, or doctrine or they find someone that they'll admire that proclaims to be a Christian. Maybe it's even friends on Facebook, or maybe they're following a teaching online, a preacher online. But do you know how many of them are, are themselves being carried away by the winds? Everything that is popular in our generation today, they'll preach it. And they'll twist the word of God to justify it. But my friend, the word of God does not change. Amen? We're going to get into that in a minute, but the word has always been the same and will never change. What was wrong before is wrong today. What is good before is good today. Let us not be carried away by the winds. It says also, it says, trees whose fruit withereth. Without fruit, twice dead, 
plucked up by the roots. What does this mean? Well, with these apostates, these false teachers, you're really going to get through the whole book of Jude. You're really going to see that they don't have the Spirit of God. They're, they're not saved. If someone finally and ultimately rejects God and the authority of God's Word, it's simply shown that they never knew Him to begin with, right? It's what we've seen. But it says here, it says, Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit. So either their fruit is withered, it's dead, or they have no fruit. And it says twice dead. They're twice dead. They're not dead. They're dead dead. Plucked up by the roots. What does this mean? There's no spiritual fruit because there's no root. Amen? For us as believers... There should be spiritual fruit in our life. If we are connected to the true vine, we will produce spiritual fruit. And it will come in its appropriate season. And yes, you may yield different amounts than someone else, another believer may, but there should be spiritual fruit. Galatians really talks about this, and we'll, we'll look at that later towards the end as well. Galatians talks about this. For us as believers to walk not after the flesh and fulfilling the works of the flesh, that's categorized as, as sinfulness, ungodliness. But as believers were to deny the flesh and were to walk after the Spirit of God, and guess what will happen, believer? When we deny ourselves and deny the flesh, we will walk after the Spirit, and what will naturally happen is spiritual fruit will be produced in you. Since we've professed Christ as Savior, have we seen love increasing in our life? Have we seen joy increasing in our life? Peace, gentleness, these are fruits of the Spirit. And they only come because someone has their root in the, the true vine. Without him, we can do nothing. But again, it's, it says this, and it says uh, they're plucked up by the root. There's, again, no spiritual root. They're dead, dead. They're going to die. And for a lost person, my friend, if they do not repent, they're going to die twice still. They're dead twice already. No fruit, no root. But unless they repent and be saved, they're going to both die physically and, and die an eternal death spiritually. It says, it says next, verse 13, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame. This is similar to what we discussed a minute ago with the clouds that are without water, but raging waves of the sea. Um, one, have you been to the sea? Some of y'all go on vacation to the, to the beach. Beautiful, beautiful of God's creation, seeing the ocean and the power and the might of the ocean and the beauty and the peacefulness and the calm. But have you ever went out to the sea the next morning after a storm? How does the beach look then? Nothing but foam and just a nasty beach. Nothing but chaos and, and refuse that is left on the beach, right? For the apostates, my friend, they are as the raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. All that they profess, again, they've rejected Jesus, they've rejected the word of God, and all that they're sharing is what's popular, What's going to scratch the ear of the lost man or the carnal man? And what is left, my friend, is nothing but filthiness and nothing but a mess. Nothing but chaos. And sadly, it says, it says foaming out their own shame, even the essence of boasting, foaming out things of their own shame, boasting about things that they should be ashamed of. Amen? Today we see that all too often. You have churches and denominations even. You have TV preachers. You have 
people professing to be Christian on Facebook. You may even have friends that do this. Professing to be Christian on Facebook, and they will share something along the lines of, well, God doesn't really view that as evil or wrong anymore. Or they may say, look, I'm saved. God loves me. He wants me to be me and live however I want to live. My friend, that is an apostate statement. And my friend, they are boasting of something they should be ashamed of. Amen? Christians don't boast in, in, oh, I'm living in sin and it's fine and it's okay and you should do it too. No, if a believer struggles with sin, it is something that they are not um, proud of. Something that they do not boast of, someone that something that they are battling and, and relying on the grace of God each and every day to fight and overcome. Otherwise, if it's boasting of, look how tolerant we are as Christians. Look how we celebrate your sin as Christians. It's nothing as foaming out their own shame. Isaiah 57, 20 says this, But the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith the Lord, to the wicked. For us as believers, my friend, we are never to have an idea that we boast or live in or celebrate sin. We know what sin is how destructive it is, the fact that it costs the blood of Jesus Christ. And we see the destruction it causes in our own lives or the lives of everyone around us that we love. And we don't boast and celebrate in it, but we with meekness offer help in the word of God to those who are struggling in sin. So we're not to boast in and cause this mire and dirt to fluff up, but really we're to dig out the deep riches and treasures of the Word of God. Amen? That's what should come forth out of that, that ocean, that sea. Digging up the deep treasures of the Word of God. It also says next, description of the apostates, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You're going to see some of these same ideas repeated throughout the description. But here again, there, it says, what does it say? That they're wandering stars. They're not fixed on the unchanging word of God. They've already thrown that out. And one, they're teaching and living what feels good to their flesh or what the world wants to hear or the way that the world changes and what's popular today. So my friend, that is a wandering star. No, it's not fixed. It's not unmovable. It's not trustworthy. Amen? Amen? And for us as believers, we're not to follow false teachers and false teaching that is doing the same thing. It's wandering everywhere. It's different today than it was yesterday. And I'm talking about these deep doctrinal truths that are clear in the word of God and they don't change. Yet with the apostates, they're always changing. But my friend, we need a, a fixed star to look up to we need to have our life and our doctrine based on the unchanging word of god amen and not compromise it makes me think of this people saying this today well no god's changed his mind god's been enlightened on this god's laxed with this now he's okay with it he wants me to love whoever I want to love. He wants me to do whatever. He wants me to be happy. But my friend, do we know that God has never and will never change? Man does not need to share his 
false dreams and ideas of, of what he thinks is right. The Bible says man is rotten and deceitful from the core. And we struggle with sin every day. We know the truth of that. That's why we should deny what our dreams are, our thoughts, or our sinful desires are, and say, no, God, you are right. Amen. God, what you have said in the beginning that was good is good. What you said was evil is evil. My friend, from the beginning, guess what? And these are things that we see today, so we must address them. We must not be a wandering star, but we must be fixed on the truth because God does not change. God, from the beginning, said that sin was evil. Today, we have people saying those things that are evil are actually good. Then you even saw, my friend, that marriage was between one man and one woman. Guess what? That's still what marriage is. We were told in the beginning that there was male and there was female, and that was it. And guess what? That does not change today, despite what man thinks he knows or what man feels. That is fixed. We were told in the beginning that, that um, murder was a sin. Guess what our generation has been guilty of? Murdering billions of innocent babies. It was murder then and it's murder now, my friend. We must be fixed on this. We must hold to this. In a lost, dying, and ever-changing world, we must be the one true light that remains the same. We also see, my friend, that there's always been one God. One true and living God. My friend, and here's a big, big truth as well. There's always been one way to him. And that is by faith in the Son of God. Amen. Man has constantly been saying, no, I'll get to him my own way and I'll worship him my own way. But guess what, my friend? The truth remains the same. There's one way to him, and that's through Jesus. Amen? That's something we must hold to. And here's, the, here's what the Word of God says. Malachi 3 and 6, it says, For I, the Lord, I change not. Man is acting like he's getting progressive and that he's going to bring in his own utopia. But my friend, it, it just takes common sense to see it's progressively getting worse because they've departed from the word and fixed word of God. Amen. God doesn't need to be informed of what is actually good. God is good. His nature is good. All of his judgments are perfect. Perfect. What he says is good is good. What he says is evil is evil. And my friend, the word of God also says, we don't need to teach God and counsel God of anything, including this current generation. Does not need to counsel God on what's actually good. And get this, believer, they do not need to counsel you on what is good. God does that because he is good. Man is not. The word of God also says, Hebrews 13 and 8, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. He doesn't change. He's the I am. He always has been. He always will be. And he's not changing. James 1 and 17, it says this, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Our lost and dead generation that we live in, they're thinking that they're blessing the world with such goodness and such freedom and, libera liberta and liberality. And they think that they're bringing happiness to mankind. But let me just tell you this. It is God who is the source of all things good. And every perfect gift. And that includes him teaching us how to live. 
He wants to give us life and life more abundant. Don't let the world teach you on what abundance of life is. The world's dead. It also says, it says it's from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, get this, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. What does that say? If you want goodness, if you want a perfect gift, if you're wondering where the goodness and perfect gift in your life has come from, it's from God, the Father of lights. And it says there's no variableness in him. There's no shadow of turning, not even just a little bit. He doesn't change even just a little bit. My friend, that's the fixed star that we can look to. That's the sure foundation that we can trust. Amen. That's what we base our life on. Our doctrine of what we believe, but also our practice. We base it on him. Because he's unchanging and he's, and he's good. So what does scripture say next? Verse 14. So we just got done with some um, uh, descriptions of analogies of apostates. Descriptions of them back to back. And now it's going to talk about the judgment of future apostates. Verses 14 through 16. It says this. It says in verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these. Enoch, even around before the flood, and that was a long time ago, he even prophesied of apostates that were coming. The apostasy that we see today, and it's going to describe here the ones that we will see in the very even end. But, I've used the phrase, consider who you are following Before you follow someone, consider their end. If it's an apostate that you're following, someone that has rejected Jesus or rejected the word of God, consider their end. It's judgment. It's judgment. It says that right here. Again, it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are among them of all their ungodly deeds. We're going to pause there for a minute. What did Enoch say? Well, it says here that Enoch actually prophesied, was given prophecy of God, and he spoke that that apostasy was coming, that people would depart from the word of God would reject the Lord, would live in sinfulness. And also, it's going to describe them more in just a moment, but it says this. It says, behold, pay attention, look. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. You know what that's referring to? That's that's referring to the Lord's coming. And if we would even read the book of Revelation, it would probably wake us up. My friend, I'm just going to tell you, God is very long-suffering. No one else in the world like him. He is very patient. He has not yet returned because he wants more to be saved. Amen? And he knows they will be. But there's coming a time, my friend where that perfect long-suffering will come to its end. It's long-suffering. There's going to be an end. And it says here that the Lord will come with ten thousands of his saints. And it says to do what? And, the, and I love this. It could be interpreted as, as holy ones. Some people speculate that Jesus is, the Lord is coming with his angels or that he's actually coming with his saints. My friend, the saved will return with him. His holy ones, his saved, his saints, the ones he's redeemed and rescued and raised, they're coming with him. And what's going to happen? It says they're coming. He's coming to execute judgment. 
upon all. This I pray we listen. Behold, look, listen. Man, I, I'm just going to tell you today, do you know how many believers are mocking God? Have rejected God and acting like God doesn't exist and they're doing their own thing? You know how many people have cursed the name of God? You know how many people are cursing the children of God, the word of God? Sadly, my friend, here's a warning to us as believers. Let us not be that, first of all. But also as believers, let this be a warning to us as well. Let us not be believers who maybe recognize God on Sunday, but live the rest of the week as a practicing atheist. Living life like God doesn't exist. Living life like we don't answer to him that we're just doing our own thing. And that we will not have to answer to him. Because let me tell you, he is coming back to judge. All will give an account, my friend. But it says here, it says to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are among them of all their ungodly deeds. You're going to see ungodly repeated in this verse for a reason. It's describing unbelievers, apostates. It's describing people that are ungodly, that don't care for God. They're doing their own thing. Let this be connected to us in no way. But it says, again, God's coming back to judge the apostates. All those that uh, may mock God and, and, and act like, God, you haven't come back yet. I don't think you're coming back. Well, there's coming a time where he's coming back. And it says he'll he'll judge. It says also, I love this, it says he'll convince all that are among them, again, among the apostates, among the ungodly, um, he'll convince among them of all their ungodly deeds. You know that people today are trying to justify their sin, even twisting the word of God to do so. And we're trying to warn people today. The word of God doesn't change. But do you know there's coming a day where he is going to convince them. They're going to fall before their knees, confess him as Lord. And my friend, everyone will see every wrong that they've ever done, and they will be convinced of it. No more justifying it. No more arguing, no, it was okay. Or I was justified in doing it in my situation. None of that. They're going to be convinced of God. He's going to show them. And it says, it says ungodly deeds which they have have ungodly committed. They've done in an ungodly manner that, God, I'm just going to do my own thing. That type of manner, that type of attitude, that type of heart. And it says of all their hard speeches, again, this is, this is um, hateful um, and, and uh, rejecting God, words that they've used, uh, criticizing God and, and the ways of God. And my friend, much of that has happened. And it says, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Again, all these things that people have said against God, and maybe they said to a believer, if your God was real, Why didn't he cast me down? Let me tell you. He hasn't cast them down because he's patient. But again, judgment time is coming. The time to repent is now. So again, description further of them in verse 16, it says these are murmurers and complainers. My friend, let this not be said among us. Let us not be negative. Let us not be be found griping. Let us not be found complaining. It was already described that those in Israel, those with Israel in the um, wilderness, that they complained about their God-appointed leaders 
They complained about them. It wasn't good enough. They thought they would do better. And guess what? That complaining was contagious. And my friend, here's the point. Apostates that know what they're doing, they will, they will share their griping and complaining and their unsatisfaction to get you unhappy, to get you complaining, and acting like they have something better to offer you. It's all about them. We saw that happen with uh, Moses. They complained against him. Ultimately, they wanted to replace him. They wanted to lead. My friend, let that not be said among us today. If God has given appointed leadership in your life, and we discussed all those areas in our life just the other day, do not try to usurp authority. Even if you think you could do it better, God didn't put you there. Let us not complain against God-given leadership because ultimately you are complaining against God. You're saying God didn't do it good enough. He should have put me there. My friend, many perish in the wilderness because of complaining. Us as believers, we are told not to complain. Even in our lives today, my friend, God knows what we need. God takes us through many storms. He gives us what we need to come out the other end for the better. Let us not complain or gripe. I know situations are hard. Many situations God did not intend, but God does want to use it for your good. So let us go to him and let us not be found murmuring or complaining or griping. Let us not look at life with just negative lenses. Let's look at with, with positivity of what, who God is, what God has given us. Let us not be connected here with murmuring and complaining. Let us not be fault-finding. Don't let that be named among us. As we look at people and interact with people, maybe it's people in your daily life or leadership in your life, don't be guilty of fault-finding. Just finding everything that you can find fault with. Guess what? You're going to find it in them, and you're going to find it in you if you're honest with yourself. But us as believers, that's not where our mind is supposed to be. Also, what does it say next? Walking after their own lust, so they're complaining, but secretly they're just wanting what they want. Walking after their own flesh, flesh or lust. But it also means this, their life is dominated by sinful desires. It also says, in their mouth speaketh great swelling words. They're, they care more of politicking, even with the apostates, church politics. Flattering people to get people to like them for their own good. They care more of that than they do of spiritual matters with themselves or anyone else. It also says having men's persons and admiration because of advantage. What does that mean? Again, they're wanting to advance themselves. Believer, let us not be guilty of this in our lives, but even in the church especially. Let not focus be on us. You trying to advance yourself, but trampling over everyone else and trying to do it. We should not, as believers, want all power and prestige. We should not want a following. We should want Christ to want a following. Amen. So again, these apostates were marked by um, this attitude of making it about them, complaining, murmuring to advance their own cause. But again, they're only being led of their own lusts, not by the word of God, not for the best interest, true best interest of those that are around them. 
I'm going to, let's take this time to conclude with these thoughts. We've seen it here in this text. Again, many people uh, being ungodly with their deeds, with their hearts, with their words. You today, us as believers, let us not again be tempted to be a practicing atheist. Let us know that we are not Lord. We are not God. God is God. And he bought us with the highest of price. We are not our own anymore. We are his. So as believers, let us realize this, but also with those that are mocking around us today. Actually, I love this verse, Psalm 94, 3 and 4, it says this. Believers may ask this often, though. How long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they speak evil or hard things? And all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. How long, God? We're living in a time where, again, ungodly people are increasing. Apostasy within proclaiming churches is increasing. And we may ask the question, how long, God? How long will this happen? Psalm 50 and 3, I think, answers that. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. James 5 and 9, though, also says this. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Amen. My friend, and that's a warning to all that have rejected God, the judge stands at the door. But also, my friend, even to believers, context of what James was even talking about. One, he is talking about the ungodly, trampling over everyone around them, acting like they're not going to answer to God. But he also just went into challenging believers not to do the same and also not complaining and backbiting those in light of their circumstance. Even though, they, even though we have been wronged many times, we are still held accountable for how we treat others. We answer for that. And then it says the judge stands at the door. My friend, as we close uh, the message today, as we, we're actually just going to have a time of prayer and reflection for invitation time. So if you will, stand with me.